This is a short video about the limit superior and limit inferior of a bounded sequence. So let's let xn be our bounded sequence of real numbers, and I'll uh, introduce these two concepts to you. So number one, the limit superior of the sequence is defined as the following. So notation-wise, we'll say lim sup of xn. And so what is it? We're going to take the infimum of the following set. So we're looking at all real numbers v, such that there exists some index capital N, such that for all indices larger than that, the points in your sequence are less than or equal to v. So another way to think about this, what is this set? You're looking at all the possible upper bounds of some tails of your sequence. And uh, what we're going to do is take the infimum of that. So again, to give you a particular example, uh, here's a picture where, again, the y-coordinates of the red dots are really my sequence, xn. And I'm trying to say that for this tail from, you know, n onward, right, v is an upper bound for that tail. But what if I went a little bit farther to the right? So what if I copy and paste it, but now I go a little bit farther? Well, now this new number, v prime, is an upper bound for that tail. And so what we're doing, right, the limit superior, the limb soup, is the infimum of all these. So like, instead of v, maybe it's v prime here, right? And so again, assuming that the red dots, you know, maybe don't ever pop back up above there. So uh, what we've got then is it's sort of the smallest of the upper bounds of the tails of your sequence. So like eventually it's a supremum is what it says. Uh, second, limit inferior of a sequence is defined as follows. So the notation is limimp of your sequence. And so what are we doing? We're going to take the supremum of the following set. So what does this stuff say? You're looking at all real numbers such that there's some index uh, for which once you pass that index, that number w is lower than or equal to the points in your sequence. So in other words, the set we're playing with is the set of all lower bounds of tails of your sequence. So to give you an example here, if I'm looking at this tail of the sequence, then that w is a lower bound for that tail, right? The red dots never get below that line w. And uh, but what if I want maybe a little bit further to the right? Well, if I want to look further to the right at, at m, say, right? So I'm looking at this tail of the sequence now. I see w prime is a good lower bound for those sequences. And so what is the lim inf? We're taking you supremum of this process. So kind of what's the highest you can go for a tail? Uh, to be an upper bound, uh, sorry, what's the highest you can go and still be a lower bound for some tail of your sequence? That's what the lim inf is. It's a lot to say, it's a little bit tricky. So what I'm about to do is to give you a characterization of the lim soup, some more ways to think about the lim soup. There would be a similar result for lim inf, I'm just not gonna uh, go over it, but it's pretty similar what you could say. So if xn's are bounded sequence of real numbers, and let's say x star is some real number, the following are equivalent. So what we're about to prove is that the next, I got four things for you, they're all gonna be if and only ifs of each other is what this means. So number one, to say that x star is the limb soup of xn, that's equivalent to saying that if you had a positive number x epsilon, there's at most a finite number of points in your sequence that are actually bigger than x star plus epsilon, but there are an infinite number of points in your sequence that are bigger than x star minus epsilon. That's all equivalent to saying, number three here, that if um is defined as the supremum um, of this tail of the sequence, so notice I'm looking at all points in my sequence whose index is past this particular m here, um, then what is x star going to be? Then the limb soup should be the infimum of the u's. And what that should be then is also the limit of the u's. And if uh, another way to say all this stuff, another way to think about the limb soup is if S is the set of all subsequential limits of Xn, in other words, S is the set of all possible limits of subsequences of your sequence Xn, then X star should be the supremum of that set. So what we're going to try to do is show that all these things are equivalent to each other. And remember how to do that is you'd probably show 1 implies 2, 2 implies 3, 3 implies 4, and then finally 4 implies 1. That will show that these are all if and only ifs of each other. And that's what I'm about to do for you. So I'll get rid of those again, and then we can start. So let's do one implies two. So remember what we're trying to do. So we're gonna to try to show x stars the limb soup implies that this stuff happens here. So let me try to draw you a picture. Uh, what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say, and maybe the idea for this, is that if you were to pick some number epsilon, you should be able to go far enough to the right to make sure that all your points 
are in this window down here, right? Just somewhere in there. I'm not saying they've got to get real close to X star. They just need to be in this window. And there can only be, there should be infinitely many points in that window, whereas there should only be finite many points that are back here, which is believable since, well, look, you only went n ways out. And that's kind of the idea for what we're about to do. So let's suppose that uh, X star is the limb soup of our sequence. So part of what that meant, remember, was there exists some natural number n such that uh, X star is always larger than or equal to n. So in other words, X star should be a good upper bound for this tail of my sequence in my picture. So then what does that tell me? Well, I mean, if X star is a good upper bound for those, well, I mean, this is a pretty good upper bound for those same dots, right? So what does that tell me then? Like I said before, if I'm only, you know, n units to the right, uh, what does that tell me? There's only n minus one possible points back here that could be higher. And so in particular, there's only finitely many points that could be higher than x star plus epsilon. And that's what I wanted to say. So now how do I actually show that there should be infinitely many points in this window here? Well, by way of contradiction, what if there existed some index m so that uh, there are infinite many points, say, below this window, right? What would happen then? So what if there are infinitely many points below that window there? Well, then what would that mean? That would mean that x star minus epsilon should be an upper bound for some tail, right? Think about it. If I had infinitely many points down here, then that green line is an upper bound for that tail. Therefore, it should be a member of this set that I've highlighted here. But wait a minute. x star was the infimum of that set. So x star cannot be a lower bound for that set. Or, so, but that's a contradiction. So if x star is not a lower bound, then it can't be the infimum, and that's a contradiction. So thus, for any natural number m that you pick, you could always go maybe a little bit past m. Oops, that's not a highlighter. You should always be able to go a little bit past m to find a point in your sequence that's above x star minus epsilon. So since you could do that for any natural number, we're saying that uh, there should be infinitely many of these points, xm. And that finishes number two. So how do you do two implies three? What's that look like? So suppose two holds, so given epsilon, then for you know an index m that's sufficiently big, we should have that um is less than x star plus epsilon. And well, what do we know that the, the infimum of these in this, right? So the infimum should be the... Uh, what the greatest lower bound for the ums here, right? So then that should be smaller than x star plus epsilon, right? If, if the infimum's a lower bound for all these, well, then it's also smaller than x star plus epsilon is all I'm trying to say. So on the other hand, what do we know from before? There are infinitely many points in my sequence that are bigger than x star minus epsilon. That's part of the hypothesis of number two. Well, in that case then, that tells me that x star minus epsilon should be less than or equal to um for every single point in my sequence, since um is always the supremum of all the tails of xm. And so what does that say? That tells me now x star minus epsilon is a lower bound for all the ums, but the infimum is the greatest lower bound. That's why the infimum of the ums should be larger than or equal to x star minus epsilon. And so uh, in that case, what have we just showed? We just showed the infimum of the UMs is between x star minus epsilon and x star plus epsilon. Since epsilon was arbitrary, you can conclude that these quantities are equal. To do 3 implies 4, what was 3 implies 4 in case I don't want you to have to rewind? So if uh, x star is the infimum of these UNs, which is the same as the limit, then that should imply that x star is the supremum of all the subsequential limits. All right, so what we're gonna do is first, let's just show x star is the limit of some subsequence. In other words, let's show x star is actually an element of that set S. So uh, what we'll do is we'll kind of define a sequence in this way. So what is U1? U1 is the supremum of the first tail of your sequence. So all the points past the index one. Well, if it's a supremum, right? Remember that's the least upper bound. Well then U1 minus one, that's a little bit less than U1, can't be an upper bound for this set. Therefore, what does that mean? You should be able to find some points in your set that are between u1 minus one and u1. And what I'll do is I'll call that index, that point of your sequence, I'll just denote it by x sub n one. Now, we can continue this process, right? I could always do such a thing. Maybe you could do it kind of inductively. So what I'm saying I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define a whole subsequence where the points in my sequence are always uh, between 
UK minus a little bit and UK. And now the idea is what happens if you take the limit of all this stuff? Well then by the squeeze theorem, if this thing goes to X star, since one over K goes to zero, and if this thing goes to X star, that tells me that the limit of this has to be X star. So X star is the limit of some subsequence, therefore it has to be an element of that set S and number four. So the last thing I gotta do, I need to show you that X star is actually the supremum of this set. So all I need to do is just show you that X star is an upper bound for this set. Since X star is in the set, if it's an upper bound, it's gotta be the least upper bound, right? So to show that X star is an upper bound of this set, what if you're given any subsequence X, N, K now? Well, what do we know? I always know that N, K is always at least what K is. So in particular, all the points in the subsequence are a member of the set, the points in your sequence, just whose index is larger than K, since N, K is bigger than K, or more equal to. Uh, so in that case then, I mean, what does that tell me? U, K is the supremum of all these, right? Well, if each X, N, K is in there, then UK has to be an upper bound for all of these as well, is what this inequality is trying to say. Therefore, if uh, this inequality is true for every single index K, then take the limit of both sides and you get lim X, the limit of the X and Ks, the limit of that subsequence has to be uh, at most X star. So X star is an upper bound for any limit of any subsequence. So it's an upper bound for S. Therefore, it's the supremum. Finally, four implies one. So let's let W be the supremum of S. And remember S is all possible subsequential limits of my sequence. So if epsilon is some positive number, then remember W is like the, an upper bound and it's the least upper bound, right? Uh, but again, it should be the biggest, the biggest limit of any of the subsequences. So W plus a little bit cannot be the limit of sub subsequence. It cannot be an element of S. So what does that tell me then? Well, there should then exist some natural number so that once I get to the right of that natural number, the points in my sequence um, should be uh, less than W plus epsilon. So Xn should never get really close to that. W plus epsilon cannot be a limit of any uh, subsequence of Xn. So then what does that tell me then? Well, this is trying to say that, well, eventually W plus epsilon is an upper bound for that tail of Xn. So therefore, W plus epsilon should be in the set of all upper bounds for tails of my sequence. But uh, wait a minute, what is the, this set, right? It's bounded below by lim sup Xn. Remember the definition of lim sup is the infimum of this set that I've highlighted. So therefore, lim sup, the infimum of that set, should be a lower bound in particular for any of its elements in particular it should be a lower bound for w plus epsilon since it's in that so we've got one inequality here lim soup of my sequence is definitely less than or equal to w plus epsilon so on the other hand i'm going to try and show you that the reverse inequality is true with a minus epsilon here so i pressed that at the wrong time on the other hand by definition of s right all possible limits of subsequences of my sequence and uh, what's W? W is the largest possible such limit. There's got to be some subsequence uh, whose limit is larger than W minus epsilon. So how come? Well, otherwise, W minus epsilon would be the biggest thing in S, not W. So that would contradict that W is the supremum otherwise. So what does that tell me then? For that subsequence that I found, whose limit has to be at least a little bit bigger than W minus epsilon, I know that all the terms in that sequence eventually should get higher than W minus epsilon. And so why is that good? Well, that tells me that if these are guaranteed to eventually always be higher than W minus epsilon, well, it's not possible that W minus epsilon, it cannot be an upper bound for any tail of my sequence, right? Eventually, these will always be higher than that. Therefore, W minus epsilon is not an upper bound for that sequence, for a tail, I mean. And so what does that tell me then? Well, remember lim soup, eventually it is an upper bound for the tail of my sequence, right? So if this is not ever one, that tells me W minus epsilon has to be smaller than or equal to the lim soup. So what have we got? Lim soup is less than or equal to W plus epsilon, but it's bigger than or equal to W minus epsilon. So if I put those compound inequalities together into one, since epsilon was arbitrary, we can conclude that W has to be the lim soup of Xn. And that finishes the big, the following our equivalent proof.
As I said, there's a similar theorem with those four characterizations of uh, lim inf. I um, encourage you to try to write those down and think about what, how they should be proved. And then the last thing, uh, why is another way to think about why lim inf and lim soup is important? It's because if you've got a bounded sequence, then the sequence itself converges if and only if the lim inf and the lim soup are the same number. So why should that be believable? Remember uh, the way I've written this, the lim inf, right? That is looking at all lower bounds of the tails of your sequence. And so what we're saying is, if, I'm, if I go farther and farther to the right in my sequence, right? I see that the lower bounds for the tails, maybe it's here, the next one's here, say, the next one's here. What I hope you notice is those lines are rising towards the orange, which is what I'm assuming Xn converges to. Whereas on the other hand, uh, if I look at it from this perspective, what's the limb soup? In that case, I'm looking at well, what are the good upper bounds for tails in my sequence? So maybe that's one. If I go a little bit further to the right, this would be a good upper bound for that tail. This would be a good upper bound for that tail. And the point is, those upper bounds of those tails are also getting close to the orange. So therefore, there exists an orange line if and only if these two things are converging to, um, again, the same number.